1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. If you're just joining us today, we've been spending the last few weeks going verse by verse through 1 Thessalonians. And we've been looking at how the believers there in Thessalonica were radically on fire for God. Uh, you recall that the church there was founded by Paul, Silas, and Timothy on Paul's second missionary journey. Uh, Paul has been commending them in the previous verses uh, because they had the same goal in life that he had. Namely, he refused to leave the world the way he found it. Uh, and they were the same way. They had become a model, an example for others to follow. And as other Christians in the first century looked around, they said, let's model our lives after the believers there in Thessalonica and let's serve God the way they serve God because they had so radically impacted the world back in their day. Now the church collectively impacted their world because individually they had impacted the world. Remember we saw that in verse 7 that Paul said that you have become an example for all the others to follow. And that word you was singular in the Greek. In other words, each and every one of them had become a model for others to follow. So it's not enough that we would just be a, a model church, but each individual Christian must be on fire for the Lord. And so we posed several questions last week looking at if everybody gave exactly the same uh, percentage of their paycheck that we, you, you give, would the giving go up or down? If everybody witnessed as many times as you did, would it go up or down? If we all showed up the exact same amount of times that you showed up, would we have greater in, uh, uh, attendance or less? And so every single member of that church, not just a handful, not just some faithful ones, but everybody in that church was on fire for God. Wow, no wonder why we're talking about it some 2,000 years later. A small church, very little resources, being persecuted heavily, and yet they impacted their world and are still impacting the world today. Well, with that in mind, let's continue to study this great church. And I'm speaking on this subject this morning, a look at a transformed life. A look at a transformed life out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, reading verse 9 and 10. Let's stand together all over the building as we honor and reverence the reading of God's perfect word. You follow along as your copy of God's word. Look up on the screen. The words will be up there for you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, reading verses 9 and 10. You fall on as I read, because this now is the eternal word of God. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you, and how you turned to God from idols, to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Let's pray together. Will your heads bowed and your eyes closed before the living God? Would you even now ask God to tune out every distraction, both internal and external, that your mind would not wander, but you'd be in tune with what the Holy Spirit has to say to you here today? And would you ask God to speak into your life, what kind of a difference are you making in this world? And has your life been transformed by the power of God? Father, in Jesus' name, we are in desperate need of a touch from heaven. And Lord, we are in need of the Holy Spirit speaking into our lives here today. And Lord, I don't know the spiritual condition of anybody here, but you do. And Lord, I pray you draw all of us closer to you, individually and corporately. And Father, there's anybody in this room that is lost, I beg you in Jesus' name, save them before it's too late. For anybody who is watching on YouTube later on, speak into their life as well. Help us make a difference in this world for your glory and for your honor alone, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, Paul elaborates in verse 9 and 10 what he had already mentioned in verse 3. In verse 3, he said that he was constantly bearing in mind their work of faith, their labor of love, and their steadfastness of hope. Their faith, hope, and their love. Here was a church that was on fire for God. They, they had a work of faith. In other words, it was a, a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that gave evidence in their daily life by how they were uh, transforming the world around them. Uh, it was evident to everybody who knew them how they had been saved by God, gloriously saved, radically changed, and how they made a difference in their life uh, of those around them they came in contact with. Then he said there was a, a labor of love. We'll look at that more in a moment. And then there's a steadfastness of of hope. They had a, 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 a hope in the Lord Jesus Christ and that's why they were able to endure the heavy persecution that they were under. 
Now in verse 9, he says, For they themselves, he's talking about the folks all over Macedonia and all over Achaia, in the north and in the south. He said, Everywhere I go, everybody's talking about what you guys are up to over there. Everybody's talking about the way that you receive the word of God and how you're impacting the world all around you because of your faithfulness to God. Now people everywhere were telling Paul how the Thessalonians had received the men of God how they received the Word of God and how they were proclaiming the Word of God to everybody they came in contact with, not only in their words, but also in their deeds as well. So when people looked at them, they said, these guys are the real deal. Now, these guys are not just talking about it, they're living it out in their daily life. And they became an inspiration, a model or an example for others to follow. Now remember, Paul was only in town for three and a half weeks. And yet that was enough for them to see, enough in Paul, that they were inspired to say, we've got to press on even though Paul was run out of town because of heavy persecution. And so they took over the leadership roles in the church, even though Paul and his buddies had been run out of town. Now it said in verse 9, For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and a true God. Now we talked about this before, that Paul was only in town for three and a half weeks because he was run out of town because of heavy persecution. And not only had they persecuted Paul and ran him and Silas and Timothy out of town, but they chased them all the way to Berea and persecuted them there as well. They were chasing Paul and his friends all over the place and persecuting them. As Paul thought about the believers there in Thessalonica, and as he thought about his time, his very limited time, three and a half weeks in Thessalonica in general, Paul could have some very negative feelings about that town. But Paul chose by the grace of God not to focus on those who rejected him, but rather on those who received him. Your life would be miserable. You spend all your time worrying about those who don't like you. You need to focus more on the ones that God's using you to minister in their lives. And so Paul didn't get distracted by the ones that hated him. He focused on the ones that loved him. Now he had been persecuted. But yet that was long enough, three and a half weeks, for these folks to get gloriously saved and radically changed, so much so they became an example for others to follow. And that can be very discouraging when folks don't get saved. Even more so when you get persecuted simply for trying to share your faith with others. But now remember, even Jesus didn't win them all. We were talking about it in Sunday school this morning in John chapter 10, about how there were some folks there that believed in God and Jesus, and trusted him as God, but others wanted to stone him. They wanted to seize him. They wanted to kill him. So even Jesus didn't win them all. And that can be discouraging if you focus on those that reject you rather than on those who receive you. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine this morning, and he's telling about a story that him and his wife, Tracy, they were, they were trying to get this cat. They had a cat, and the cat got his head stuck in the can. And they're trying to pull the, cat, the, cat, the cat's head out of the can, trying to help the cat out. But the cat was so frustrated, so scared, nervous, and he's scratching them up. And they're getting scratched all up trying to help this poor cat. Finally, he said we had to get a towel and wrap it around the cat and get him settled down so we could pull his head out of the can. Now, sometimes it can be that way when you're dealing with folks and trying to witness to them. I mean, you want to put them in a headlock and kind of just get them in there. But sometimes they just don't receive it. And even though you're trying to help them, they're persecuting you like that cat was persecuting my friend but trying to help him out. But we've got to focus on the ones that are receiving us and don't get so distracted by the ones that run you out of town. So we can learn a lot from Paul in his focus. He didn't focus on the ones that ran him out of town. He focused on the ones that welcomed him in. So let's take a look at these elements of a transformed life. And the first one I notice is our surrender. Notice our surrender there in verse 9. So when Paul would talk to people around town about the believers in Thessalonica, and remember he was trying to tell the people there, he said, let me tell you about the folks there in Thessalonica. And they said, we already heard. We're already aware. Their, their testimony's gone out everywhere. And we already know about the people there. Well, what do they know about them? They knew about their surrender. And he says he knew how they turned to God. That word turn is the Greek word epistrepho. And it means to be converted, to return, to turn about, to turn again. You see, they did what every believer in any generation must do. That is, they repented of their sins and they trusted in Jesus Christ to change them. 
the Thessalonians did what the pagans in Lystra failed to do. The same gospel came to those folks, and yet they did not do what the people here in Thessalonica did. There, Paul and Barnabas were on mission with God. And they healed a man, and the crowds tried to worship Paul and Barnabas as a couple of pagan gods, Zeus and Hermes. Listen to the story in Acts chapter 14, verse 14 and 15. So, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, heard that these folks were trying to worship them as a couple of pagan gods, they tore their robes and they rushed out into the crowd crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. What he's saying is, why are you people worshiping us? You've been bowing down to these pagan gods and we're calling you out to repent of that, to turn from these pagan gods and to turn to the true and living God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the believers there, and the people there failed to become believers and do what the believers in Thessalonica did. Now repentance and faith go hand in hand. You can't have salvation without repentance and faith. Listen to what Jesus said in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. He says, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Yeah. Repent and believe in the gospel. You've got to do both. Here's what Paul told the elders there in Ephesus. In Acts chapter 20, verse 21, he is saying farewell. He's been there for three and a half years. He was their pastor. He mentored them, led a lot of folks to faith in Christ, poured his life into them, and now he's moving on, and he's challenging them, and he reminds them about his ministry there for the past three and a half years. And he says, I was solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's not only repentance, it's faith. It's not only faith, it's faith and faith. Repentance. You've got to have both sides of the salvation coin. We turn to God from the idols. There's got to be repentance. and There's got to be surrender to the Lord. Now notice he says that they turned to God. We surrender to God himself. Not just to a set of doctrines. True Christianity is a relationship with the God of the universe. The Lord Jesus Christ. It is not just some ritual. So, some religious duties that we engage in. It's not just going to church and reading our Bible and praying and doing all these religious duties. It is a relationship with Almighty God that is played out through our religious duties. But don't get so distracted by all the religious activities that you forget about the relationship with the living God. So they turned to God, not to a set of new doctrines. Well, a transformed life involves our surrender, but let's take it a step further. It also involves our separation. What about our separation? So as Paul will go around town talking about these folks, and here's the testimony they're telling me about you. They're telling me how you turned to God, but they're also telling me about how you turned from the idols. Now notice they didn't turn from idols to God. we got to get it in the right order. We turn to God from the idols. Before we can have successful separation from our sins, there must first of all be surrender to our Savior. Now many people try to clean themselves up and then come to God. They say, well, I'm not really ready to get saved just yet, but let me go ahead and clean my life up a little bit. Let me stop drinking. Let me stop cussing. Let me stop uh, going out to the bars. Let me read my Bible a little bit more. Let me pray a little more. Let me come to church once in a while. Let me just start doing all these things and stop doing all the bad things, and then I'll give my life to God. The only problem with that is you can't have the strength or the capacity to do that without Almighty God helping you to do it. We're sinners by nature and by choice, and we sin because it's fun and we love to sin. It's the Holy Spirit in us who helps us see sin the way He sees sin. And then we can turn from those idols when we first of all turn to God. So we've got to get in the right order. We, get, we come to God, we say, God, I surrender myself to you. Help me and clean up my life. Charlotte Elliott had it very well in that familiar hymn, Just As I Am. Just as I am, without one plea, 
but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Why am I coming? Because Jesus Christ called me. I didn't choose him, he chose me. He says, just as I am, and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot. I I'm not trying to clean my life up. I'm not trying to get myself straightened out, and become more religious, and become more holy and pure. I, I can't do that. I've got to come to God as I am, a dirty, vile, no good sinner. It says, and to thee whose blood can cleanse these spots. Only the blood of Jesus can cleanse my spots. Nothing I could do could possibly pay for my sin death. All of my good deeds are like filthy rags to a holy God. So I must come to him and beg for mercy. And as I come to him and I surrender to him, then his blood washes me clean and makes me new. And you all got to get with me, I'm telling you. I bet you all not this quiet at the ball game. So he says they turned to God from the idols. That word idols is the Greek word idolon. It means an image for worship. It speaks about a heathen god. Now remember that all the other gods out there don't exist. They're just figments of deceived minds and corrupted hearts. It's not that Jesus is better than the other gods. He's the only god. There is no other god. They don't exist anywhere. Except from people's blackened hearts and confused minds. And it's not that the Hindus have 320 million gods and then they're just not as cool as Jesus. They don't exist. It's not that Zeus and Hermes and all these other pagan gods uh, are not as, as good as Jesus. They don't exist anywhere. They're idols. They're vain images that people bow down to that don't exist anywhere. And so Jesus alone is God. And that would have been a good place right there for somebody to shout Amen. amen. Nothing must take the place of Jesus. Absolutely nothing. The first and second commandments make this very, very clear. He, he says that we are to have no other gods before him. And then he takes this step further. He says in the second commandment, and don't make yourself any image that you would bow down to it. So Jesus must be top priority in our life. And nothing can come before him. He will not share the throne with anybody else. And he alone is God. I think I told you this story before about how I was in a Dunkin' Donuts. Could we just have a moment of silence with Dunkin' Donuts? <laughs> and, and always a good flock brings Dunkin' Donuts to Sunday school. And if y'all weren't here for Sunday school, you missed out on Dunkin' Donuts. But I was in a Dunkin' Donuts. And a lady behind the counter asked me, would you please be witness to her? She said, I'm a Christian, but uh, my boyfriend is not. He is a Buddhist. Could you talk to him? I've tried to talk to him before, but he does not listen to me. Perhaps you can get through to him. So me and my brother went over and talked to this man, and we started witnessing to him, and he says, yes, that sounds like something I need to do. I said, are you repent, ready to repent of your sins and surrender your life fully and completely to the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, I'd like to do that. I said, okay, here's what you need to do. You need to renounce Buddha and confess that he is a pagan that can help you out, of, not, not, not help you out at all. And you must surrender your life to Jesus and renounce Buddhism altogether. And here's what he said. He said, I don't want to do that. What I want to do is I want to be a Buddhist and a Christian. I said, Buddha might be okay with that, but Jesus is not. That's right. That's right. So Jesus says, there will be no other beside me. You cannot just play the field and say, well, maybe the Buddha's got it right, but just in case, let me go with the Christians. If they don't got it right, let me try the Muslims. Let me try the Hindus. Let me just play all the fields and see if I can get it right with one of them. Because one of them must be the right one. And so Jesus says, no, that's not going to work for me. You must renounce all pagan gods and surrender fully and completely to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And you cannot have salvation unless you have done that. And that's what the believers there, they were pagans that worshiped false gods. And Paul says, I go around town, everybody in town is talking about you. And here's what they're telling me. They're telling me how you did what I saw you do when I was there for three and a half weeks, but they're still doing it and they're still talking about it, how you've radically turned to God from those pagan idols. How do we know someone has been born again? Because they're radically different life. That's how. If they still go to the same old places, if they still hang out with the same old crowd, if they still talk the same, if they still watch the same movies, tell the same dirty jokes, they're only fooling themselves. 
So there's our surrender and our separation, but what about our service? Notice our service in verse 9. It's another aspect of a transformed life. So these folks were so radically on fire for God that Paul said, everywhere I go, people just can't help talk about you guys. And, and they're telling me about how you turned to God. They're telling me how you turned from the idols. And they're telling me that you're now serving a living and true God. Wow. Now that word serve is the idea of a slave. But listen, God didn't force them to do it. It was a labor of love, as Paul's already pointed out in verse 3. When you love the Lord, it is not a burden to serve Him. The problem we have in our churches is we have too many volunteers, not nearly enough bond servants. Volunteers get their feelings hurt and give up too quickly. Volunteers don't like the program, so they just want to help out where they feel like helping out. Servants say, I'm here to serve the living and true God. Tell me what can I do to help out? Amen. How can I carry out the ministries in this church? Amen. You never have a shortage of workers when you have servants. Remember, I've already told you, just go back and check it out. The sermon's up there on YouTube. Each and every single one of them were an example of how to serve. There was no lazy people in this church. There was no absent members coming and going whenever they felt like it in this church. There was nobody stealing from God in this church. They all tithed. They all gave. They all witnessed. They all served. They all showed up every time the doors were open. Y'all all right? Amen. You didn't have to say, well, well, where's that old boy been? Well, it was hunting season. We haven't seen him in a while. You love the Lord, you'll show up. That's a Super Bowl. Don't you know it's a Super Bowl? They don't show up when the Super Bowl's on. They love the Lord, they will. Right. I, I got to say with a smile, you think I'm angry. My buddy, check, check out my Facebook post. I, I shared a, a quote from a friend of mine. I was quoting somebody else in a sermon today. And he's talking, and in, in, in essence, he's saying, basically, that people in a church today, they do not allow church activities to interfere with their daily lives. In other words, they want to go fishing, they go fishing. They don't care. They want to go to the beach, they go to the beach. They don't care. It doesn't matter what's going on in the church. It doesn't matter if you revival. It doesn't matter if you've got vacation Bible school going on. It doesn't matter if you got Sunday service, Wednesday night. They don't really care because they got something else that's more important to them. They're going to go. These folks didn't have that problem. Wait a minute now, they're a small church. Very little resources. Persecuted heavily for their faith in Christ. And yet, they're still impacting the world 2,000 years later. We've got a lot of folks not even impacting the world today, let alone 2,000 years from now. Say it with a smile. I know y'all don't watch the World Cup, but it's going on. The rest of the world's watching it. And it's going to be the most watched game today, the World Cup final. More, more so than NBA games, more so than anything else. We don't think a whole lot about soccer in this country, but anybody else does. And I guarantee you those folks are going to shut down the cities to watch the game today. People spend thousands of dollars on airfare and hotels and tickets to fly over to Russia and watch the World Cup. Some of them, their teams have, been, have long since been kicked out of the uh, World Cup uh, the tournament, but yet they're still there. We're in the colors cheering. We, we don't let the things of the world... Uh, we, we, don't, we don't forsake those things for going to church. We love the Lord, we will. I told you two-thirds of the church don't even show up. So what they said was, Jesus Christ changed my life, I love the Lord have a desire to make an impact in this world for the glory of God, came down an altar, said, I want to get saved, want to get baptized, want to join this church. Are you going to get plugged in because we need workers? We don't need spectators in here. No, I want to get to work. And then three months later, you can't find them. And they're drifting from one church to the next, not doing nothing for the kingdom because they got their feelings hurt somewhere down the line. That wasn't the problem with the church at first Thess uh, Thessalonica. Now, there was a lot back then that didn't really serve the Lord. The writer of Hebrews said, don't forsake the assembling yourselves together. In other words, don't skip church. 
as is the habit of some. Wait a minute now. You mean some of them made a habit to skip church? They weren't showing up. They weren't giving. They weren't serving. They weren't tithing. They, they weren't uh, helping out. They weren't witnessing. Yeah, there were some folks back in the day. Things haven't changed in 2,000 years. Jesus says there's always going to be a shortage of workers. That's why you need to pray for God to raise up workers to go out into the harvest. Because there's more work than there are workers. It's a numbers game. Two-thirds of the folks don't show up. Doesn't matter whether you're running 40 or 4,000. I told you Woodstock got 19,000 members, maybe 6,000 show up today. Where's the rest of them? I mean, good night with the music program they got there and the preaching they got there and all they got going on there. Can't find your way to church? Wow. So it's just, just got to pray and say, Lord, help me to get serious. This time's running out. I'm going to stand before you one day. So these folks, they did it not only because they uh, need to be done, they did it because they love the Lord. And we love the Lord, we'll have no problem serving. Wow. So in verse 9, it says that they had turned from their idols. There was a time in their life when they were bowing down to these pagan gods, worshiping false idols, passionate about it, spent their time, their energy, and their money in the pursuit of ungodly things, but now they've been so radically changed by God, now all their time, their thoughts, their passion, their money was devoted to carrying out the Great Commission. So they had wasted their lives serving Satan and worshiping dead idols, but now they've served the living and true God. Wow! Only God knows how much time and money and energy I wasted on ungodly things before I got saved. Didn't think twice about it. Smoking cigarettes, going to the bar, hanging out in the club with the girls. Didn't care about it. How much is that beer? I don't care. Whatever it is, give me one. Oh, uh, Sunday, you're not going to go to church? No. Never go. You're not going to read your Bible? Don't even know what it says. Couldn't quote two verses in the Bible. It's one thing to do that when you're lost, but when you claim to be a Christian... Y'all all right? And let's smile, Lewis. So in verse 9, he says that they were turning from, to God from the idols to serve a living and true God. Wow. What a model for us today. So in verses 6 to 7, Paul says, You became imitators of us. Talk about himself, Silas, and Timothy. That he mentioned in verse 1. And he said, What you guys did, we came to town. We modeled what it means to be a true Christian in front of you. We well, only there for three and a half weeks, so you didn't get a, a good glimpse at us very long, but that was enough for you to say, hey, this is what I want to do in my life. I want to be like this guy. And so for three and a half weeks, he modeled the Christian life in front of them. And then he says, you became an example of us and of the Lord. Because somebody would say, well, well we don't follow men. We know that we're following Jesus. But if we're following men who are following Jesus, we will be following Jesus. So if we follow Paul's example, we'll be doing all right. And so they said, you followed us and of the Lord. And now what happened was these young Christians who only had leadership in town for three and a half weeks, good night, they became an example for others to follow. So I put a quote of somebody out there on Facebook the other day that Judas had the best pastor, the best preacher, the wisest person ever lived, and the most godly influence you could ever possibly have in your entire life. He had Jesus to follow, and yet he still didn't get right with God. He died and went to hell. So the problem is not the leadership. It's the people that don't have a, an attitude to say, I want to get right with God. And so these folks had Paul as an example. Some of them received him and responded in obedience. Most of the folks ran him out of town. Wow. And so they saw Paul serving the Lord, and they said, let's do it like Paul does it. So they, in turn, became like Paul and served the Lord, and other folks said, let's do it like the folks in Thessalonica are doing it. Wow. What an example for us to follow today. Well, a look at a transformed life involves our surrender, our separation, and our service, but finally our suspense. What about our suspense? There in verse 10. First of all, we're waiting on the return of our Savior. 
So what were they doing while they were serving the Lord? Verse 10 says, And to wait for His Son from heaven. Wow. Every Spirit-filled Christian is living for Jesus, is longing for Jesus, and is looking for Jesus. You ever been away from a loved one and, and you just couldn't wait for them to get back? And then you anticipated their return. And maybe somebody will pull in the driveway and you jump up and look, thinking it might be them. We ought to be that way with Jesus. Constantly looking at the sky and saying, maybe on that cloud, maybe, maybe, maybe. Today's the day. Living with expectation. Lord, I'm ready to meet you. So that word wait, it means to wait for someone with patience, confidence, and expectancy. Now listen to what Warren Wiersbe said. He said, a local church that truly lives in the expectation of seeing Jesus Christ at any time will be a vibrant and victorious group of people. Wow. Expecting the Lord's return is a great motivation for soul winning and Christian stability. It is a wonderful comfort in sorrow and a great encouragement for godly living. So what he's saying is, if you really anticipate that Jesus is going to come back, and he may come back before he even get done talking, maybe a thousand years from now, I don't know, one thing is guaranteed we're all going to stand before God one day. Whether it's through the rapture or through death, we're going to stand before him, give an account for our thoughts and our words and our deeds. But if we live with the expectation, and Paul did in his day, that Jesus can come back at any moment. You say, you know what? I better make sure I'm doing the right thing when he gets here. I don't want to be thinking anything I shouldn't be thinking when he gets back. I don't want to be saying anything I shouldn't be saying when he gets back. I don't want to be doing anything that I shouldn't be doing when he gets back. I don't want him to catch me over here in this place doing this kind of behavior if Jesus was to show up right away. Wow! You say, today would be a good day for him to come back. Right now would be a great time while I'm in church shouting amen. What about last night? Was that a good time? Uh, what about Thursday afternoon? Was that a good time for him to come back? And so we need to ask God, help us to live in expectation like these folks were. And no wonder why they were so radically impacting the world in their day. Good night. And then when you really believe that Jesus can come back at any moment, you start thinking, who do I know that's lost? And if Jesus came back, there's no hope for them. And you start thinking, well, if I don't give them the gospel, who's going to do it? If I don't love my own family and my own friends and those that God has placed in my care at work and in school, if I don't love them enough to give them the gospel, who's going to give it to them? Am I just going to hope that they're going to tune into some old Billy Graham crusade? That maybe they'll just show up out of nowhere to church? That maybe they'll just go on our YouTube channel? Or are we going to say, God, I need to personally give them the gospel? Like these folks were. They didn't just say, well, hopefully Paul will send us a letter. We can just say, hey, read this letter Paul wrote. No, they said, let us go out there and witness to people. And everybody in the church was doing it. Wow. I told you that they say only 3% of Southern Baptists have ever one time in their entire life shared the gospel with known lost person. It's not that only 3% do it on a regular basis. They've only done it once in their entire life. 97% have never, ever in their entire life shared the gospel with somebody they knew was lost and on their way to hell. Wow. Good luck with that on Judgment Day. Not only is the return of the Savior, what about the resurrection of the Savior? So Paul goes on in verse 10 to say, whom he raised from the dead. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of of Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor John, is the resurrection really that important? Some folks don't believe in it. Is it important for salvation? I say emphatically yes. It is imperative that we believe in the resurrection for salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, 17, Paul says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Wow. You think Paul thought it was important, the resurrection? If he didn't die, he wouldn't have been buried. If he hadn't been buried, he wouldn't have been raised. Had he not been raised, he wouldn't have ascended. Had he not ascended, he would not be on his way back. 
The resurrection is vitally important to our salvation. And Paul took every chance he could get to mention it. Well, finally, we notice the rescue by our Savior. The rescue by our Savior, there at the end of verse 10. He says, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Wow. Look at chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. So we'll get to this in a few months and we continue our journey. And Paul says in chapter 5, verse 9 and 10, For God has not destined us for wrath. He's speaking to the church, the believers. But for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only source of salvation. Jesus tried to tell the folks that back in his day in chapter 10 of John. We looked at it in Sunday school. They didn't believe him. They got so mad they wanted to stone him. But he is the only source of salvation. Some folks thought he was crazy. And they said the guy's got a demon and he's a lunatic. Wow. They found out, didn't they? So we obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, remember now when the Bible talks about being asleep, it's not what some <laughs> folks do in church, nodding off on a preacher, right. <laughs> talking about whether we were alive or whether we're dead. So he'd already mentioned up there in chapter 4 that the Lord's coming back at any moment. And some folks are going to die before he gets back, but some folks are going to be alive when he does come back. And he says, whether you're dead or alive, he's coming back when God tells him to come back. And he says, whether you're awake or asleep, we will live together with him. So Jesus saves us from the wrath of a holy God. And he alone can save us. We love to quote John 3.16. What about John 3.36? He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, for the wrath of God abides on him. Wow! So the wrath of God is pictured as hovering over our head. And when we breathe our last breath, if Jesus Christ has not saved us, then the wrath of God will be poured out upon us for all eternity in the lake of fire. With no hope of parole, no getting out of there, no relenting of the wrath of a holy God. But Jesus can save us from that wrath because he took the wrath for us when he died on Calvary. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been saved and spared and rescued from the wrath of God? Do you know anybody who has not been spared from the wrath of God? Do you know anybody who's lost? And then the next question is, what are you going to do about it? When you leave out of here today... And you go back to work tomorrow. School will be starting back up in a few weeks. You're going to go hang out with your buddies there. I know all your kids are looking forward to that. And God is going to say, I have placed you in this classroom so that you might give them the gospel. Remember, we looked at that back in verse 1. That God had strategically located these individuals in Thessalonica. Thessalonica was a, a real hub city where people come and go from all over the place. It'd be like going in and out of Orlando or in and out of New York, a big city where people coming in from all over the world. That was Thessalonica. And God said, I have placed you strategically in this city so that you might give folks the gospel. Then when they get saved, they're going to carry the gospel to other parts of the world. And so you have people that God has placed at your work and your family and your neighborhood and your community and your school. And God wants you to give them the gospel. If you've been spared from the wrath of God, and somebody took the time to share the gospel with you, who are you going to pass it on to? These folks didn't just say, well, thank God Paul came to town and gave us the gospel. We got saved. They turned around and gave the gospel to other people. And the Bible says that their faith in God was going out all over the place. So Paul says, I don't even have to tell anybody about you because they're telling me all about you. And here's what they're saying about you, is that you turn to God, you turn from the idols, your life is so radically different now. You are now serving the living and true God. You're no longer serving those pagan idols. And you are now waiting with great expectation for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back. Wow. Does that describe your life? If we get serious like the believers in Thessalonica did, we'd be amazed at how God would use us, not only here in this community, but around the world. They impacted the world, not just their town. We'll do the same thing if we get serious too. But each individual must get on fire for God. And the church is only as strong as the individuals. 
Well, we continue to have two-thirds that don't show up. A bunch come on Sunday morning, but never any other time during the week. Not serving, not giving, not witnessing. This church will never be what God's called us to be. We need all hands on deck. We need all hands to be faithful. Let's stand for prayer. Praise team is coming. They got a song of invitation picked out for us. This is the most important part in the service. It's time for you to respond to what God's been telling you. So maybe you want to come down here and get along with God at this altar and say, God, I just want to ask you, uh, am I really sold out to you? In what areas of my life should I be more sold out to you? How's your giving? How's your serving? How's your attendance? Now, are you an example and a model for other people to follow? Or would you have to say, I hope they don't give like I do or the church wouldn't be able to pay the bills. I hope they don't show up like I do or they have to just start canceling services. If they witness like I do, then you probably won't need nobody to the Lord this year. Now, are you an example for others to follow? It all comes from surrendering to God, being sold out to Him and serving Him with great expectation He could return at any moment. Maybe you need to come down to the altar and say, God, I need some work in my life. Paul certainly confessed he needed some work in his life. If he needed it, how much more do we? Let's pray together. Father, You are an awesome God. And You are most certainly worthy of our very best. And we confess, Lord, that too often we don't give You our best. And Lord, we ask you to forgive us. And Father, I pray that you would help us, that the Holy Spirit would speak clearly and specifically into each and every individual's life right now. And you reveal to us specific ways that we are not pleasing to you and how we can do better. And Father, as we looked at, this church was on fire corporately because each individual was on fire for you. And Lord, would you bring that same passion and faithfulness to each and every member of this church. And Lord, would you help us to go and find people in this community that are lost and give them the gospel before it's too late. And Father, would you move right now during this time of invitation. And Father, is anybody in here that's lost, I beg you to save them in Jesus' name. Father, move now as only you can. We're going to praise you for every decision that happens here today, both public and private. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God has...